This is a story of how I changed from a dreamer waiting for technology to evolve because it was so much better than the current way of doing things, to being more of a practitioner, finding out how I can most enjoy what exists today. This introduces my motivation for making a series on medium and large format film sizes. Because I visit sites like TED Talks and Popular Science and Mechanics and so on, I know of the advantages of the future. And because of the history of products listed on Wikipedia, I know of the usefulness of the tools of the past, which have been put aside. I had a philosophy that if I needed some product to perform a task, say a video camera, if I could not afford a camera that does the best job at recording a moving image within reasonable spending limits, or if the technology in this case to record an image were not very good yet, then I would not buy anything, unless I had to. And if I had to, I would pick the cheapest product that just did what it needed to do to get the job done. This was so that I didn't waste a lot of money on something that couldn't do the task as well as the real best to be released years later. If I knew that there was going to be a real best released years later, and one of my current choices will end up in a closet, it's much better for it to have been the cheapest thing that will just get the job done ending up in the closet rather than the second best thing, which also will have the second best price tag ending up in the closet. I found that many other people have this way of thinking, but I found an exception. A way to have the best solution without paying or waiting for it. Luckily there are some areas where this philosophy does not apply if photography is one of them. The reasonable spending limits for most people would mean that they couldn't get more than a full frame 35mm digital camera. I know that 35mm cannot make a print that encompasses most of my vision sharply. Therefore, I judge it to fail at my purpose of photography, to provide a true-to-life replication of a scene that allows me to re-experience it at my leisure. Because there is nothing digital that can be thought of as affordable which can fulfill this purpose, my old philosophy would say, I'm not going to be able to pursue this hobby. But there exists a previous technology that already solves the problem better. It can record any side scene with amazing detail, more cheaply than the image recording technology being invented today can. There are not only film cameras called medium format that shoot film akin to what IMAX uses. There are large format cameras, the ones believed to be ancient with bellows, that shoot film 4x5 inches, 8x10, various sizes up to 20x24. There is still a 20x24 Polaroid camera available for rent. And all of these largest cameras with film cost under 15 grand, with a heavy tripod, filters, film holders, and several lenses. Still less than today's medium format digital cameras for a far superior result. So this begins the battle against circulating notions that film has died, particularly for cost reasons, and that I'm just a complete silly puss when you see me in a field with a black cloth over my head. I must not be caught up with the times, but I object. I was for all anticipating the advent of digital cameras and every other renewable source of fun, but then I saw how much currently exists that I would be missing out on if I didn't use it before a newer technology like a digital camera, finally became good enough to replace the older technology. When I was younger, of course, when you're young, you have no money. So you want to do everything for nothing. I wanted an electric car, digital camera, I wanted to have my own communication network separate from cell companies, wanted to have a domain on a root DNS server different from those owned by ICANN, so nobody could shut it down or demand payment for registration. I wanted solar power at my house. Basically, I wanted to do everything in such a way it was a large principal investment, and then it would be nearly free from then on. You'd have the benefit of it being yours forever. Nobody could tell you that you can't travel because you're not buying their gas, or that you can't have energy because you're not paying them anymore. After you do more research, you will find that today, all of these things are not only more expensive principal investments, than the long tail cost of conventional method of solving the problem of transportation or power or what have you. So each alternative is more expensive on the whole. Secondly, all these alternatives don't do what they're supposed to do very well yet. There are no electric cars that combine their advantages of constant torque at all RPMs and amazing efficiency with endurance. There is a way to make a car that will have great performance and endurance 
with a safe method of storing energy, no pressure or cryogenics or flammability. But that metal hydride energy storage solution is currently very expensive to produce. It would be a method combining lithium-6 and palladium, and lithium-6 requires a particle accelerator to be able to produce any decent quantity of. So while you could store more hydrogen in that way than you could if it were metallic hydrogen, within the same volume, it's very expensive to do. So the car is touting to use so many different fuels in the same car, when that multiple hybrid car costs 40 grand instead of the exact same 20 grand model with a gas engine, there is no way the gas could ever cost 20 grand for the vehicle over its lifetime. So it's a huge waste of money to get things like Lexus's latest hybrid or the first generation Prius. It's basically for the people who have money to burn and are willing to support the development of the technologies, but it's not a wise choice. It's not any cheaper. Solar panels will make a lot more energy than wind turbines for the money invested because it's frequently more sunny than it is windy, but both take 10 or more years to pay themselves off. And I mean that literally, because in this state the energy co-op will pay their retail electric rates to anyone putting power back onto the grid. For a system that can put out 2 kilowatt hours all day long, at 11 cents per kilowatt hours, it would take 8 to 10 years to put the money back into your wallet that it cost you for that system. Although, your power could never go out and it requires very little maintenance. It will be the thing that we will switch to. Another example is with rocketry. The idea that a single ship that doesn't dump anything into the ocean to get to orbit seems like an elegant solution. You don't need the tracking and coordination teams to find all those things and bring them back in coordination with airlines and shipping lanes and so on. When you want a rocket to go up, you just find a window and go for it. Uh-oh. To get into orbit, you need to have a ship that weighs 1% of what all the fuel weighed to get you up there. Kerosene and liquid oxygen can do that. But that's not the futuristic, efficient, and renewable method, like using a nuclear aircraft carrier to perform electrolysis, cool that hydrogen and oxygen into the fuel tanks, and then launch the rocket from sea. The problem with hydrogen, even though it has a very high specific impulse, is that it requires insulation to keep it cold and a lot more of a container due to its large volume at the same mass. So a rocket would be 20% or more of the weight of the fuel. And that poses problems when getting into orbit, which is why NASA uses solid propellant boosters. You could go all the way and use propane delivered to variable nozzles for the best efficiency at all the altitudes, but the cost of the engineers and the special one-off parts, you'll need to make that one cheap rocket launch cost, is a lot for the whole program. Russians went the other way, and they just basically built more Saturn V's. You can send a lot more payload into a space at a time more cheaply because the rockets are built for more off-the-shelf parts. So it's an example of efficiency would be nice, but the technology is not there to make the entire choice of going down that path cost-effective. The assurance of a renewable fuel in any of these cases does make you sleep better at night knowing that there's no oil cartel that can screw with your overhead costs, but you could be making more money and spending less of it using the conventional methods. So I can't wait to have an electric car that for 20 grand will go to zero to 60 in less than three seconds to get 500 miles per charge, or to eventually have a plane that if I feel like it could just go up into a low orbit to get across the country in record time. But we're just not there yet. Another component to add into this continuous spending method, a perceived con, is how American minds currently view jobs and investing. The classic beginning of the last century way of thinking was that you exchanged time for money. Whatever money you got that month goes to pay your bills, and then you repeat the next month and so on until you aren't able to work, and then you stop. At the beginning of the last century, many people were saving at least 10% of the money they made. So combined with employers' pensions, they did very well in retirement. Since the advent of Social Security, savings have been diminishing. So now people only think they have the money that they make. And so for hobbies, where one has to constantly buy a supply, people are discouraged because many people believe money is a finite resource which needs to have their time traded for it. That is ridiculous. There are numerous investments which will pay you monthly greater than 10% annual percentage yield. 
That means in 10 years, if you were investing at least 10% of your income into these investments, they would be making as much as your job. In three or four years more than that 10 year time, they'd be making four or five times what your job was making. There is no need for a career beyond what you're interested in because any job that anybody takes should only need to be had for at most 10 years. And then they'll continuously make that much from then on. It's unfortunate that most people don't see this. They think that the job is slaving away forever and that there is no escape. No, plan out how long you would have to work until those, for example, a monthly dividend paying stocks to reinvest themselves will take until it will pay off your bills. So a point that you don't have to work anymore, even though it would be wise to continue your job until your investment income became several times your salary. At such a point, it would be a waste of your life to continue your job. But this is relevant for two reasons. First, I like to make public service announcements. I like to say things I wish people who needed it most could hear, but that's not how the internet works. That's why I'm just barking in the dark. Secondly, it points out the flaw in ever wondering how much film development cost, or how much fuel cost, or your groceries, if you wanted to cook better, more expensive foods more often, and so on. When considering recurring purchases, a person spending all of their money, basically a person in the working class, would consider these things to be a constant drag. To someone who is wisely investing their money in long-term, stable, high-yielding dividend stocks, precious metals necessary to different industries, and so on, a person in the capitalist class, if they wanted to add a new recurring cost to their budget, all they do is find out how much more money you need to invest to cover the repeating costs. They invest that money, reach the goal, and now they can afford to have that thing because it is free to them forever. In fact, investing for the things that you want to do is a motivator to be able to do much more because that investment will continue to grow far beyond what was needed for just that one repeating expense. When considering whether you want to be shooting with film or with digital, you should know that there is no choice. Film is in fact much cheaper. The bigger cameras with more resolution than any digital camera will have for a decade is cheaper than medium format digital cameras today. But if you did your work first and invested the time wisely, any choice you made will be free. The cost is completely not an issue. The real issues are portability, retrieving mobility on site and after development, and how you are able to print or project or otherwise distribute that recorded image. These are the points you have to use when you decide on that specific event and subject which one you should head out the door with. But there is no fiscal reason to have to choose one or the other. As I push in this video series, however, being someone who enjoys the most immersive photograph, the biggest and sharpest, without anything to suspend your belief that it's real, I highly recommend medium and large film formats for the most satisfying result.